And welcome to Landfear Live, the summer flagship speaker series sponsored and presented by the Watchell Conservancy. Following recommended social distancing guidelines, we're offering the 2020 lecture series, our third season to date, in the virtual space via Zoom. A few of us are present tonight, keeping social distance, in the makeshift studio we've created here in the Chaplain B. Barnes reading room, in the Landfear livery, in the heart of Watchell. I want to remind you that all of this season's Landfear Live talks have been recorded and are available to view at our website. You can find them if you go to the Events tab and click into Landfear Live. From there, scroll down and look for past 2020 presentations. If you missed any of these presentations real time, I know you'll enjoy these videos. Or if you were crazy about one and want to recommend it to a friend, this is a really easy way to share it. Good evening, Zoom audience. My name is Peter August. I'm the science advisor for the Napa Tree Point Conservation Area managed by the Watch Hill Conservancy. I'm a URI prof emeritus, and first and foremost, I'm a fluke fisherman wannabe. So for me, tonight is a very special lecture. Um, if you're a saltwater fisherman, you know Captain Dave Monty. He's been fishing for 45 years. He holds a U.S. Coast Guard Master Captain license and runs no fluke fishing charters and tours out of, out of Wickford. Captain Monty is the Vice President of the Rhode Island Saltwaters Anglers Association and the Vice Chair of the Rhode Island Marine Fisheries Council. Dave is a board member of the American Saltwater Guides Association. And if that's not enough, Dave is a fishing columnist for the Providence Journal, the Sun Chronicle, and 11 different weekly newspapers in the area. Dave's writing covers fishing policy, regulations, marine spatial planning, and fishing tactics and conditions. Dave Monty is highly sought after on the lecture circuit and is a featured speaker at boat shows and fishing clubs throughout the region. We're, we're very, very fortunate that he was able to make time to join us tonight. The title of his presentation is Fishing Among the Giants. And so please join me in giving a big warm welcome to Captain Dave Monty. Thank, Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Um, this first slide, Fishing Among Giants, um, is here for the very reason that is there's something very majestic about wind farms. I can't tell you, I'll uh, be with uh, charter customers and we'll be six miles away and they'll insist that we go to the wind farm just to go below those turbines and look at them. There's something very, very majestic and you'll actually uh, hear this in the presentation. But I'd like to thank the uh, uh, Watch Hill uh, Conservancy and the uh, six people in this room uh, that is uh, actually putting this on. And I'd like to thank you, the, the audience that's listening to this, because either you're interested in offshore wind farms or you're interested in fishing, and both of these things are my passion. So I thank you very much for participating. This uh, next slide, Pete pretty much, Peter pretty much went uh, over it. Um, I'd just like to point out one thing, that I am the vice chair of the Rhode Island Marine Fisheries Council, and I am a recreational representative. So if there are recreational fishers out there, uh, please feel free to always uh, email me with any concerns you have ab about fisheries in Rhode Island. This is the council that makes uh, fishing regulations for both commercial and uh, uh, recreational fishing. Actually, we make recommendations to the DEM director, but she has so much faith in us, about 95% of the time she approves those recommendations. So that said, I'd just like to get into the presentation by starting out with two videos. And we do have the video links here for you to screen them at uh, some other time on YouTube. We're going to try it tonight. It might be a little choppy but I think they're very important to the conversation tonight. The first one was produced by an organization called Anglers for Offshore Wind. And it's a group of uh, fishermen who believe in the responsible development of offshore wind. They recognize that offshore wind is a valuable renewable energy source and we really need it to help combat climate change. 
but they're for offshore wind as long as they are responsibly developed with research before, during, and after construction um, with no unexpected harm to uh, fish or, or, or habitat um, and, and mitigate uh, any disturbance that we uh, possibly can. So this is a, um, um, a short video, and I'm going to introduce the second one too, uh, and maybe we could play them back to back when we get there. The second one is from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management called BOEM. And this is a research video, and I think it sets up the discussion nicely tonight because it talks about research at the Block Island Wind Farm that actually occurred uh, a few years ago. And the research that you're going to see in the video has actually been ongoing. It occurred before construction, it's occurring, uh, it occurred during construction, and is now uh, continuing after construction, and I have an update from what you're going to see uh, in that video. So that said, perhaps we could play the first video, uh, which is from Anglers for Offshore Wind. So today we took a trip off of Block Island to see the Block Island Wind Farm, and these are the only five turbines in the entire country that are in the water. It's a completely different experience to look at them online or in a book and to fish underneath them. It's a very cool experience. It's just phenomenal with uh, recreational anglers. Uh, they are in awe of the, the majestic uh, turbines and they're so extremely interested in what the wind farm is doing for habitat and fish uh, in the environment in general. From a recreational perspective, we think it's a very positive thing. We see the structure is a, a great resource and habitat for recreational fishing there's an abundance of fish because of the new habitat that has been created from 80 or 90 feet worth of structure there on, on each pylon. We were catching fluke today, like in and around the wind turbines. The fish were there. I believe it's gonna provide a lot more benefit to sport fishermen. These artificial reefs that are gonna become their own small ecosystems, that are gonna attract new baits. It'll be a good thing for concentration of fishing effort. It has had a very positive impact in my industry. I know a lot of my brothers and sisters that have charter boats, some a little bit larger than mine, actually have uh, enhanced their business with tours of the wind farm. We are cheerleaders for doing it right. And from the recreational fishing perspective, that means guaranteed fishing access. It means a commitment to ongoing scientific studies to monitor the fish that we care about and it means opportunities for everybody to be able to provide public input. As a charter captain, the fish that I catch in the ocean today is vastly different than five or 10 years ago. Ocean wind, uh, because of its renewable energy aspect, is extremely important for us uh, to stem the tide uh, with climate change. I think today we not only saw the first United States offshore wind farm. I think today what we saw was the first United States offshore wind showroom. I think it was built as an example to show the nation how it could be done well. On a cold January morning, a team of scientists from the University of Rhode Island heads to the waters surrounding America's first offshore wind farm. They're studying sea life around the structures that lie just a few miles off Block Island. We designed our sampling strategy to take samples close to the turbine foundation and then extend outwards. The team is collecting data needed to better understand the reef effect created by the turbines and evaluate whether the impact is positive or negative over time. Overall, the colonization of the structure happens relatively quickly and the change in the bottom community can take four or five years to really show up. A grab sampler collects small chunks of the seafloor that are carefully evaluated for any life. We knew we had to take a lot of samples to be able to accurately detect change. We collected 121 samples and that gave us 
just over 18,000 individual organisms that were counted. A second piece of equipment, a float camera, lowers to a set distance above the seafloor, taking a picture every three seconds. The images are high enough resolution where you can actually see the tubes that some of these worms and amphipods build. By sampling the area over several years, the team will build a comprehensive picture of how the area is changing over time as a result of the wind farm. Nearby, a second team of researchers from the University of Rhode Island and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute are deploying hydrophones to monitor underwater sound created by the wind farm. The team evaluates both the volume and spread of sound generated by the wind farm's construction and operation. And, and it allows us to assess whether this is uh, injurious to animals or, or people. Getting good data requires extensive sampling to account for the many factors affecting sound underwater. That involves the shape of the seabed and the shape of the subsea floor, the ocean temperature and, and salinity and currents. These studies are part of a comprehensive project funded by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management to monitor the wind farm. While we want to see energy development, we also want to make sure that we're responsible stewards for the ocean. And so with this first wind farm, it was the opportunity to go out and make those measurements. Everything from the laying of the cable to connect the wind farm to the power grid to each stage of construction and operation of the wind farm is being studied. You can take that information and you can put it into your predictive models of what will happen in the future. Initial models predicted a fairly large sediment plume would be created laying the 25 miles of undersea cable to connect the wind farm. But monitoring the operation with acoustic backscatter sonar showed the plume was actually too small to detect. So it's important to get that real information so that our predictions in the future are better. In other cases, the predictions from the models have turned out to be correct. For instance, the airborne sound from the spinning turbines was verified to be inaudible from Block Island. We have taken measurements over approximately three months, and we weren't able to detect the, the turbines at that distance at all. The underwater sound from operations has turned out to be relatively minor as well. It was less intense than a, than a fishing boat going by. And the construction activity appears to have little long-term physical impact on the seabed. The features that were made are kind of ha half healed already. But one effect of construction the scientists knew would be significant was the sound of pile driving to anchor the turbine foundations to the seafloor. It's something that occurs over a fairly short period of time, but that's where you have probably the most disturbance to the environment. And so with this first wind farm, it was the opportunity to go out and make those measurements while it was being constructed. Above the water, the sound was clearly audible and quite loud close to construction. Around about 500 meters away, it was approaching 100 dB, but that, that trails off quite rapidly in the air as you go away. But sound travels much farther through water and has the potential to cause harm or alter the behaviors of sea life. The acoustic environment affects these animals. You want to make sure as best you can that any impacts are minimized. So the acoustic team developed a plan to capture the full range of underwater sound created by the pile driving. Some of our hydrophones, which are underwater microphones, we set at high gain, very sensitive. And some we set at a little lower gain and less sensitive. And it turned out the sound came right in between. The team set hydrophones near the construction and farther away they towed an array of hydrophones behind a boat and dipped a hydrophone at several locations to build a comprehensive acoustic profile of the sound. First you have to understand what it is, how loud it is, how far it can travel, and then you can start talking about, well, how best can we reduce it or change it if, if necessary. This is giving us really good data to try to refine our models and our understanding of how the propagation into the ocean carries and how the animals hear it. Ultimately, it is about collecting quality data to make scientifically informed decisions going forward. Everything gets better when you get data and you can get out and compare your theory or your model to what is actually measured. And the more measurements we do, the better the modeling gets. And this is a great opportunity to get out there right before it happened and while things were occurring and then afterwards and learn what actually does occur so that when we go out into the future, we can predict what will happen based on better information. This information will be incorporated into BOEM's environmental review of future offshore wind farm projects. So tonight's discussion guide, very quickly, um, we're, we're talking about fishing in the Block Island uh, wind farm area, and I'm going to share some photos with you. The economic impact of fishing is something we're going to cover, both commercial and recreational fishing. 
Both are very important to Rhode Island. Um, offshore wind farm plans, what's in store for Rhode Island, Massachusetts, the East Coast, I think in context, it's pretty important when we talk about the Block Island wind farm, which incidentally, as you all know, was a pilot project. And so uh, any learnings that we can gain from the Block Island wind farm are being applied to other wind farms. Uh, wind farm uh, fishing benefits, we're gonna review those quickly. One of the major ones is the reef effect of pylons. Um, and then where, sort of where do we go from here and part of that solution are groups like Anglers for Offshore Wind that we're gonna share with you. And then we're gonna have a, a, a discussion and a question and answer. So just gonna jump right into it. Hopefully those videos uh, gave you some context, uh, but these photos that I'm about to share with you are all fish that were caught uh, in the Block Island wind farm area. And I don't necessarily mean right next to the turbine, although some of them were, but in the general uh, area, Block Island wind farm area. And you can see these are some great codfish that were caught a couple of years ago in the wind farm area. In the deeper water, there's a lot of humps and, and bumps there. Um, uh, black sea bass uh, are quite abundant uh, everywhere in the Northeast now, but to t particularly at the Block Island wind farm, right up close to the turbines. And you can see uh, this is Captain Paul Eidman um, uh, from New Jersey, who was experiencing fishing in the wind farm area because New Jersey's gonna have some wind farms pretty soon. Uh, more codfish caught in the general wind farm area. And this is the staple of the Block Island wind farm. Summer flounder, uh, or as we call summer flounder fluke, as well as black sea bass. Uh, these fish were caught right in the wind farm area within a half mile, I believe, of the, of the turbines. Um, this uh, gentleman probably looks familiar to a lot of you. This is Mike Wade of Watch Hill Outfitters. Uh, this is a, a, a nice uh, summer flounder that he caught a couple of years ago in the wind farm area on a fishing trip. And then commercial fishermen, it's important to note, fish the Block Island wind farm area as well. Uh, um, uh, Bob uh, Murray to the left is a commercial fisherman, also a recreational fisherman. You can see some of the fish commercially that he has caught there. And um, this is uh, Block Island uh, Fish Works, Captain Chris Willie with the mahi, not necessarily caught at the Block Island wind farm, but they are starting to appear in the area now. And so the hope is, is that other pelagics will appear there as well. So it's important to note that uh, uh, both recreational and commercial fishing are important to Rhode Island, um, the Northeast, and the United States of America. Um, here in Rhode Island, uh, according to Fisheries Economics of the United States, and that's a, a published study that NOAA does, updates every year, that in Rhode Island, recreational fishing has a $412 million annual economic sales impact to the state of Rhode Island. Commercial uh, uh, fishing has a sales impact of $333 million. And in all fairness, that number doesn't include imports. It's just fish uh, landed in Rhode Island. So in Rhode Island, uh, the, the importance of recreational fishing, and that's an all-in number, hotel rooms, gas, um, uh, you know, charter fees, bait and tackle shops, et cetera. Um, in Connecticut, it's uh, 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 fairly uh, even. In Massachusetts, uh, commercial fishing uh, is about two to one over recreational fishing. But to give you some indication, in, in states like Florida, you know, recreational fishing far surpasses commercial fishing. So it, it varies from state to state. The message here is both recreational and commercial fishing are important um, to the state of Rhode Island and our nation. This uh, gives you a little insight. I'm gonna put my uh, glasses on for this one. This gives you a little insight. You could see the Block Island wind farm, which is number one, sort of in the center of the fly, uh, slide, but you could see what's planned for off the coast of Massachusetts in, in Rhode Island. Uh, we have Vineyard Wind, which is the green, number five. Uh, that's an 84 turbine um, uh, site. Uh, and then you see uh, sites two, three, and four. And just like one, uh, they are owned and operated by Orsted. Um, the first one 
uh, to be operational of that group is going to be the Southwalk Wind Farm, which is 15 turbines, and then um, Sunrise, and, excuse me, then Revolution and Sunrise will come online. And you can see uh, number six, um, which is the Mayflower Wind site. You can see the Empire Wind site. So you can see there are quite a few uh, wind farms. Uh, when you look at it in its totality, and these slides are provided by uh, the National Wildlife Federation, by the way, you can see this is the East Coast. And so it really puts it in perspective. Uh, there are quite a few uh, lease areas, but the ocean is a large place in comparison to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, what real estate is dedicated to wind farms is, is, is not a, uh, a big number. But you can see that um, there are sites uh, right off of uh, New York that are being uh, developed. Um, uh, off of the coast of New Jersey, we have Ocean Wind, um, uh, which is another Orsted site. So I just thought I, we'd put it in perspective by sharing some of those. In its totality, the offshore wind market, we have three uh, pie charts here. The first one are state policy commitments. And what we mean by that, the, these are governors from the various states that have committed um, to so many megawatts of wind power by such and such a date. Now you can see um, in this uh, state policy pie, Rhode Island, uh, and, and incidentally, this is uh, January 2020. These numbers have been updated over the last six months, but I just don't have the updates here. But Rhode Island is shown as 430. A big piece of the pie is New York uh, in New Jersey. New Jersey with 750 and 9,000 um, for New York. And you can see that's by the year 2035. Uh, in those cases. So it's not like it's going to happen tomorrow. It will be over time. The second pie chart in the middle are projects have, that have been awarded uh, to date. And that totals 6,444 megawatts. But what is committed, you can see at the bottom, is 26,246. And then what is actually online, there's only one, and that is the uh, Block Island Wind Farm in Rhode Island, which is 30 megawatts. So it's the first wind farm uh, in this nation, and it's uh, serving as a model for others. So we do have quite a bit of uh, work to go. So there's a lot of concern about this, and that's what we're here to address tonight. Um, the Block Island Wind Farm is a pilot project, was commissioned in 2016. There are five six-watt megawatt um, turbines. It provides 17,000 uh, homes with, uh, and businesses with power on Block Island. The remainder of the power is sent via cable uh, to, to the mainland, to Rhode Island. Uh, fishing access for commercial and recreational fishing is allowed right up to the pylon and the bases. Uh, the only offshore uh, wind uh, uh, turbines uh, in Rhode Island is the Block Island Wind Farm, as I mentioned. And it's about 17 miles uh, from uh, Point Judith, about three miles southeast of uh, uh, Block Island itself. Uh, the wind farm um, was done as a pilot project and it was done right, um, working closely with recreational and commercial fishermen. And I was one of those recreational uh, fishermen as a party and charter boat captain that had input into the process with the Rhode Island Party uh, and Charter Boat Association, as well as the Rhode Island Saltwater Anglers representing the private angling community. Um, so it had uh, great input at the start, uh, and it was done right with research. And what I mean by that is that there was research, as those videos uh, outlined, uh, done before construction, during, and after construction. And why that's important is that uh, you want to be able to do a comparative analysis there. Uh, so you need a baseline, and that's uh, what the research before gives you. And uh, there are a number of species uh, studied at Block Island uh, via a trawl survey, which is still uh, underway. Uh, there are lobster surveys that were done. There were habitat surveys, acoustic surveys, bird studies. Uh, Oh, you know, I was in a room with 50 scientists presenting all of the research on the Block Island Wind Farm, and it was, um, it was uh, quite impressive. 
That research was actually shared at the Southern New England Offshore Wind Energy Science Forum, um, which happened about uh, three years ago. Um, and the finding then, because the Block Island Wind Farm was operational, is that there were no remarkable adverse effects on the environment, fish, habitat, mammals, birds, or people. And I say people because uh, there were social scientists that even studied the impact of tourism, the impact of real estate on Block Island from actually seeing these turbines. And there was no remarkable impact. In fact, tourists kind of liked it because they said it's a, it's a renewable energy source. It's the first one in America, and we really want to see it. So scientists at the forum, however, did raise some concern about the cumulative effects of hundreds of turbines, as I just shared with you, uh, in the same area. And those uh, impacts were uh, unknown in the United States. They are known in Europe, where wind farms have been around for, I believe, 15 or 20 years. So they have been measuring impacts. And we do have some key learnings uh, from their experience, which I'll share with you shortly. So you want to measure uh, the impacts. And I'm not talking about just negative impacts, you want to measure the positive impacts too. Uh, and there could be cumulative positive impacts. And some of those uh, positive impacts, I'd like to share a study called the Meta-Analysis of Fish Abundance at Offshore Wind Farms. And this study was a uh, 2019 peer-reviewed study published in Fisheries Science and Aquaculture magazine. And basically, this study, this sounds odd, studied other studies. So any study that was done in Europe on a wind farm where they studied uh, a species within a wind farm area and then had control areas outside the wind farm, um, th and if it was peer reviewed, they considered that an acceptable study. So I don't know if there were 25 or so studies that were examined. And the conclusion was that so far, offshore wind farms in Europe have had a positive impact on the abundance of fish within their boundaries compared to the control areas outside of the wind farm. So that was, uh, that's very encouraging. And it leads me to think and believe that we are going to have a positive cumulative impact with multiple uh, turbines and wind farms um, uh, for recreational fishing specifically. Uh, getting back to the Block Island project, um, recreation fishing is still good there. I shared some of the fish that were caught two, three, one year ago, but it's still very good, perhaps a bit better than it was before. And this is in spite of, I say, 200% increase in fishing pressure from the recreational side. When I would go there and fish before the wind farms, there might have been like seven, eight, nine, ten boats. Uh, uh, on, on a given day, you go there, there are like 30 boats, 40 boats fishing there, depending upon the day, 50 even some days. So it's added pressure. It's a destination. Uh, we're going to the Block Island Wind Farm. So it's easy to find. So in spite of this added pressure, fishing is still good and I think arguably a bit better. Um, gill nets are still to this day set in the wind farm area. Those are commercial nets that are fixed in the water. Uh, commercial fishermen trawl right alongside the wind farm. Uh, and recreational rod and reel uh, fishermen, as well as commercial rod and reel fishermen, fish right up to the pylons. Uh, uh, and everyone is there fishing. Seem, everyone's catching fish, and everyone seems to be pretty happy with the result of that uh, wind farm. Uh, most recently, the seventh, 17th annual Ronald Baird Sea Grant uh, science Symposium was held, um, actually is still being held, um, um, uh, in 2020 uh, uh, due to COVID, they broke this symposium up into four Zoom seminars. And so far, uh, uh, these learning as we go seminars uh, uh, study habitat, ecosystems, noise, and energy admission in the benthic communities at the bottom. Uh, and also to come is the food web effects. But this is sort of a, uh, an update uh, on the earlier uh, studies that were done. And uh, so far, still no major impact. However, uh, 
There are uh, temporary impacts, certainly from pile driving that we saw at the Block Island wind farm. So uh, that is being to continue to monitor, monitor, and there are steps that are being taken actually to mitigate the impact of uh, pile driving in uh, future wind farms. It's important to note that the Block Island wind farm has had a lot of benefits for recreational fishing. Um, first of all, you can fish right up to the base of the pylons. Uh, charter captains and private recreational anglers are all sharing positive uh, experiences there. And the species that are caught there, and I'm not saying that the wind farm brought all these there, but some of them there are in more abundance. If black sea bass, uh, uh, blue fisher nearby, mahi-mahi is on the way. It's starting to be caught in the area. Uh, they were being caught at the east grounds, fishing grounds, um, a, a couple of miles away. Actually, this weekend, um, uh, fluke or summer flounders being caught there. I shared some photos of cod that were caught in the area. Uh, striped bass are, are actually at the wind farm but private anglers aren't fishing for them with rod and reel because bear in mind the, the water is uh, 80 to 90 feet deep there, but spear fishermen are actually spearing them at the base of the pylons. And certainly scupper are abundant there. Uh, European studies done at the base of pylons uh, have demonstrated that four tons of mussels per, t per turbine are, uh, are being grown. And I know when the Block Island wind farm turbines, uh, excuse me, pylons were in, this is even before the turbines were on them, it, you know, I was right up against them and it was six months and there was, you know, like, you know, four to five inches of muscle growth on them. And uh, this is the way the bottom of the turbine looks now in this uh, photograph. And you saw in the video that we shared, you actually saw video footage at the base of pylons. And what you saw are, uh, you know, small fish uh, feeding off of the mussel growth. And then you had uh, a little bit larger fish like black sea bass and scup uh, feeding on those. And then circling, there were blue fish and large striped bass uh, ready to pick off the, the scup and black sea bass. So it truly has uh, created uh, a habitat. Um, the artificial reef effect has been outstanding. So each uh, uh, turbine foundation, or pylon if you would, um, colonizes uh, organisms. There are barnacles, sponges, mussels on each of the turbines and uh, creating a lot of biodiversity. And this is great at the Block Island wind farm. It's going to be particularly great for areas that don't ordinarily hold fish. And a lot of the wind farms being built, for instance, in New York, uh, recreational fishing really doesn't occur there. It's a basically a mud bottom, but the anticipation and the expectation is that the pylons will create this artificial reef effect and will bring fish to the area and will be a destination for recreational and uh, commercial rod and reel fishermen. So, the expectation is that, this, that wind farms are going to have a cumulative positive in fact, uh, impact uh, for recreational fishing. You can see that recreational fishermen as well as commercial fishermen uh, fish together at the Block Island wind farm, and I think that is possible certainly with other wind farms. Um, I mentioned the fishing pressure uh, being increased because it's a destination. And uh, this photo, I like to uh, look at this photo. This is the Block Island wind farm. Each of the um, turbines are a half statured mile apart from each other. And if you'll notice between turbine three, which is the, the one in the center, and two and four, you can see some white specks. Those are 40 foot sport fishing boats. So they're quite large boats. So you can see the distancing. The wind farms in the future will be, um, uh, in the Coast Guard approved, a nautical mile apart from each other. So a nautical mile, I think, is 1.6 of the uh, miles, uh, 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 of a statute mile, a regular mile. So you can imagine there's going to be more than twice the distance, as you see in this slide, uh, the turbine separated. And the Coast Guard has issued a report saying this is the plan that they endorse uh, for, for safety 
uh, in future wind farms. So uh, this is a beautiful photograph too, uh, courtesy of uh, Orsted. So some comments from anglers uh, that I uh, interviewed uh, uh, for this presentation and articles I've written before. Uh, this is Jack Sprangle from East Coast uh, Charters. Um, uh, says, uh, uh, quote, uh, the wind farm is a good thing for our fishery, creating uh, current breaks and more food for species like tatog, black sea bass, and others. You might say these pylons, pylons excuse me, will be like rock piles uh, uh, that we are all searching for out there. They will aggregate fish just uh, like oil rigs do in the Gulf. And that has been true in the Gulf. Uh, and the Gulf has not only aggregated ground fish, but has started to attract pelagic fish, uh, or has for years, tuna, mahi-mahi. And we can start to see this happening a little bit at Block Island, but the cumulative effect of multiple uh, turbines uh, is hope, uh, hopefully will bring this. And you have to realize, as one of the videos uh, pointed out, that when you have uh, a reef at the bottom of the ocean, it's pretty much at the bottom of the ocean. It may rise 20, 30, 40, 50 feet, but uh, the uh, pylons are actually however deep the water is. So you may have an 80-foot column, uh, so you have an 80-foot high reef column, if you would, and this occurs at each of the uh, pylons as well as at, at the bases. Um, Rich Hittinger of um, um, uh, the Rhode Island Saltwater Anglers uh, fishes the wind farm all the time. And he says, in late fall, we caught a dozen nice cod fishing the edges and humps in the wind farm area in deep water. The fish uh, were, were there, and the fishing was good. And this last uh, quote from Captain Frank, I'm just going to read a little bit of it. Uh, the area hosts uh, soft bottom in every direction for dozens of miles with water uh, depths. There are reefs there on either side, by the way with water depths of up to 125 feet. There would likely be concentrations of mahi during the summer months. Tuna would probably also show up in the fall, so on and so forth. So charter captains, private anglers, um, uh, and as you saw, commercial fishermen, rod and reelmen, trawlers, gillnets, uh, lobstermen have all set their gear around the Block Island wind farm because there's fish there. So where, where do we go from here with this ab abundance of uh, wind farms? Uh, uh, from a recreational uh, perspective, uh, the community needs to engage each project with re recreational fishers, you need to be engaged in each project, at hearings, advocating for research and monitoring plans. And this is key. Recently, the South Fork Wind Farm uh, released its research and monitoring plan, uh, and that particular wind farm is developed by Orsted. And that, that plan uh, uh, had uh, four studies and two others that they were supporting uh, uh, for, for the species that are caught in that area. Um, and those studies are taking place now before construction starts and will take place um, uh, during construction and after construction. So these are, this is the type of research and monitoring plan we need with each wind farm. Communicate understanding between federal government angles and developers on this issue of access. Uh, fishing uh, is allowed right up to the turbines. And the Coast Guard has repeatedly said this. And quite frankly, developers don't have the right to say you can fish there or you can't. Uh, uh, this, is, this is a right that that we have uh, in the ocean. So uh, fishing will be allowed in future wind farms as well. Um, organize coastwide to develop a recreational industry voice. And I'm going to share uh, a, a little bit of what Anglers for Offshore Wind has done. And I'm sure there's more to come in this area with recreational fishing. And then develop some type of coastwide recreational working group is a sounding board for developers because developers truly need the input of uh, uh, recreational fishermen as well as commercial fishermen. And I think this uh, working group uh, has some merit. Uh, I mentioned Anglers for Offshore Wind. Uh, they produced that uh, video that you saw in the introduction. Um, 
Um, they believe that the choice is clear, that uh, a bipartisan uh, state and federal uh, 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 bipartisan uh, partnership is behind uh, offshore wind. And if done right, it can be extremely beneficial for recreational anglers as we experienced by the Block Island Wind Farm, as well as the European experience with greater fish abundance. Uh, what uh, make sure developers hear uh, from recreational <coughs> anglers, this is key and was the success at Block Island. And then anglers' uh, uh, principles created were created for this purpose. And what I mean by that are the anglers' principles of anglers for offshore wind. And those principles are um, access, public input, and science. Uh, guaranteeing uh, access, um, um, and I, I mentioned to you that that is not the preview of the developers, but they're very supportive of that, uh, and certainly the Coast Guard is. Um, uh, public input, um, uh, participation at public meetings and hearings, et cetera, of each individual project. And this is kind of burdensome for recreational anglers sometimes, but it's absolutely necessary. And then science, and we've been over that. Make sure the research is done before, during, and after construction. So um, those are the principles. Here's some information about Anglers for Offshore Wind. Their uh, website is anglersforoffshorewind.org. It's a pretty simple uh, URL. And they have a lot of information on hearings and, and articles uh, on, on that website. So uh, basically, that's uh, all I had uh, for tonight. And I thank, thank you very much uh, for sharing my two passions. Uh, offshore wind renewable energy uh, and fishing. Would you please join me in giving Dave a big Watch Hill Conservancy Landfear Live a round of applause oh. for a great lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dave, thanks so much. Thank and you. audience, thank you for joining us tonight.